Hello, my name is Daniel Burgess. We left off, uh, we're discussing Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, verse 14, where he, Jesus likens himself to a serpent on the pole, uh, which is a reference to Numbers chapter 21, uh, which is where we left off discussing. In 21, verse Five, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread, which Jesus said he was the manna from heaven that they're, they're loathing. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. Uh, looketh is the word rawa, which means to see. And uh, Jesus in John 3, verse 3, says to Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See is the word ido, which means to see. It has the same meaning as rawah. And Moses made the serpent of brass and put it upon the pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Beheld is a different word. It's the Hebrew word nabat. And it means to entrust a value to something. In Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, he says, If I have told you of earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Uh, believe is the word pistuo, and it means uh, to trust or to value something. Uh, pistuo is the uh, verb form of pistis, which is the word faith. Faith and believe in your Greek Bible are the same word. And they both have the idea of entrusting a value to something. You believe that you trust something to do something and to be something. You believe some, something has an intrinsic quality. Uh, as far as what's difficult about seeing the serpent of brass, a little picture of the tabernacle. And the Jews camped around the tabernacle. Dan on the north side, Judah on the east side, Reuben on the south side, and Ephraim on the west side. And uh, this was roughly two million people camped around the tabernacle. So the camp was obviously far greater than the actual tabernacle. But the Sinai terrain, which had the people much discouraged, I'll try to show you all some pictures. This is just a Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary. This is sort of a generic Bible tool. Uh, they come in handy as a quick reference. But that's Sinai. Yeah. Another good picture over here.
This one's supposed to be from the traditional Mount Sinai, looking down from the top, looking down. So imagine two million people camped around this on that terrain trying to see this one object in the middle. It's a difficult situation to say the least. But in verse 9 when it says you have to entrust it to have a value, what are you supposed to trust about a snake. There's this is reason people don't talk about this very much, and it's because Jesus is comparing himself to a serpent, and our typical biblical notion of a serpent is negative. And uh, there's three points I want to discuss concerning this. One being, the snake has the expression of corruption. Two being that the Pharisees called Jesus a devil. And three being that Jesus and the serpent both say the same message, uh, that ye shall be gods. A lot of people don't know Jesus said that. But so I want to look at these three points. Uh, my goal time is 30 minutes. Not sure if I'll be able to discuss all three points. Uh, probably discuss the up to the first point. But, but as far as uh, serpent being the expression of corruption, uh, the serpent was an expression of the Israelites murmuring. The soul of, pe of the people was much discouraged, and the people spake against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. Our soul loatheth Jesus. We, we don't like Jesus. If you, com you can compare this. I like the verse in Numbers 11, verse 5. Well, I'll back up a little bit. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. So the people despised the manna, which was the free gift of the Spirit from heaven. Heaven being where we're trying to get to. But, so, the snake with the poison in its mouth that's going to kill you uh, is the very expression of the Jews' murmuring. Uh, I like pointing out that Jesus said, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Uh, I think this is what Jesus meant there in action. And just like First Timothy one verse nine, it says the the law is for sinners; it's not for the righteous. So, let me read it. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers and manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, liars, 
perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, so the law is made for sinners, just like the serpents were made for the Jews murmuring. to reveal the nature of, of sin overall. Uh, they're not doing anything that Eve didn't do. Which is lift herself up for resources. They want fish and cucumbers and garlic. They want it to have advantage over the things that fulfill their desires. And they want to be able... Well... They want to, you know, access to these things that give them pleasure. So the law, in a way, is a manifestation just like the serpents coming out of nowhere uh, of the sin in people's hearts. And I'm saying that because I want to compare lifting the serpent on the pole with Colossians 2.14 because we really need to understand this act of lifting something up as not only getting on the path of from earth to heaven and the picture of redemption but also the picture of crucifying corruption. Sorry, I can't figure out where Colossians is. And you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So, saying that the law is hanging on the cross with Jesus, and Jesus compared himself to a serpent. Hanging on the cross, hanging on a pole. Uh, is redeeming the problem, is solving the problem. Acts 3.19 explains blotting out a little better. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come in the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you by all the prophets in the Old Testament, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, like I just said. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that the prophet shall be destroyed from among the people, which will not hear that prophet, they shall be destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, likewise foretold of these days, Ye are the children of the prophets of the covenant which God hath made with our father, saying, Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus Christ, sent him to bless you 
and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Uh, raised up in verse 22 and in verse 26. Uh, let me tell you right. Anaistheme, I believe. Anaistheme. It's a combination of ana, which means in the midst of or in the middle of, and histeme, which means to stand. Um, so it's saying God's going to raise Jesus up in the middle, stand him in the middle as a mediator between heaven and earth. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and that's how he'll bless us, and that's how he'll turn us away from our iniquities. And turn away is what repent means. Repent. Which is the whole context. Verse 19 starts with, Repent, therefore, and be converted. Iniquity is the word pornea, and it has the idea of prostitution, or selling yourself for money. We're going to see some more of this. First John 3, verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever have this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Which we're going to remember. Truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before the Lord. For if our heart condemn us not, God is greater than our heart who knoweth all things. And condemn is referring to the adversary that condemns you, or Satanas that condemns you. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God, and whatsoever we ask we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments. And his commandment is to love one another. And if we love others, we'll be willing to die to help them. To lift them up. Like if you think anybody's beneath you, then you're obligated to lift them up. If you believe in being like Christ. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us the commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he has given us. Which we're going to see some more about Christ being in us. John 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So, and Jesus says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And these things I command you, that ye love one another. Uh, 
in John 10, verse 18, Jesus says, uh, no man taketh his life from him, but he layeth his life down. And all of this reference to giving your life for somebody else is a reference to the serpent on the pole. Because the way Jesus gave his life was by hanging his body on the cross. Mark eight thirty four. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Take up his cross. Uh, take up is the word arrow, which literally means to lift up, arrow. In Greek, it's A-I-R-O, but it is where the word arrow comes from because when you shoot an arrow, you launch it into the air, you lift it up. And Jesus tells us how to lift up our cross by, by losing our life to find it. You're going to have to give up your life to find your life. Which is what happened... Essentially, Eve in the garden had what she wanted. She had what she wanted. She was tempted to lift herself up to be a god, but she already had it. And we're going to see that. But if she wasn't interested in taking advantage, she, she would have had all the advantage in the world. But because she wanted to take it, she lost it. Jesus goes on and says, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And again, Mark 10, 21. Jesus was uh, instructing a man and he said, uh, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. Take up is the word arrow. So Jesus is equating lifting up your cross with selling all that you have to this man. If you want to hear Jesus preach this completely, uh, Luke 12, chapter 12, verse 15 through 34, you can hear Jesus preach this. Let's look at Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said unto the disciples, If any man will come after me or follow me, let him deny himself. Deny is the word aparneomai, which means to completely and fully contradict. And take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus is equating lifting up your cross with completely contradicting yourself. And he goes on, 
For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is it if a man profit if he gave the, gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Galatians 5.24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Affections is the word, it's basically the word pathos, pathema, and it's, where you get the idea of passion. It's not always negative, but it has the idea of extreme emotion, which suffering uh, is like the greatest example of extreme emotion. And lust is the word epithumia, which means to breathe hard after something, to be covered hard, or to be covered completely with uh, breathing hard. That's a huge biblical concept. Because your breath is your spirit. Which is how he led into this. This I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these things are contrary one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And he goes on to explain the works of the flesh. And then the works or the fruit of the spirit. But they that are Christ have crucified. Staros, uh, it, it's literally the common word for crucifixion, for Roman crucifixion. In the Old Covenant, I'm, run, I'm running out of time. I find a similarity to this giving up of your own will in the Old Covenant. I wanted to read a lot of this. Psalms 50, 7, verse 7. Psalms 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy fold. For every beast of the field uh, of the forest is mine, and cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all of the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. So God is saying that he will not, that's, he's not looking for the flesh of bulls and goats. He's not waiting to be fed by you. Isaiah chapter 1 uh, has some pretty hard language that compares to Hebrews 10 verse 4. Here, we'll go and look at Hebrews 10. Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And the body that he's prepared, all that blood ritual was about equality and making every single Jew flesh of their flesh and bone of their bone. It was a testament to uh, social equality. 
sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. And he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first covenant that he may establish the second covenant by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And this goes on. A lot of really good stuff in here. But what God is looking for, you can find in Psalms 51, 15. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth and show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart thou will not despise. So that's what the Lord is looking for. We just hit 31 minutes. So I didn't even get through my first point of three points. But I say these things out of a love for truth, out of a love for anybody that values this book. In Jesus' name, amen.